Okay, so uh, let me give you a little intro into Elena. I gave a little bit of an intro um, in the email that most of you guys probably saw, uh, but let's um, give you a bit more of a background so you know who you're dealing with right here. Um, so Dr. Elena Gross, uh, she's finished her PhD. So she used to be a chronic migraine patient herself, right? So this is a bit of a personal story. And due to the lack of effective treatment options at the time, if you, any of you are migraine sufferers, I'm sure you, you know, understand that you know, there's no perfect solution right now. Um, she pursued a master's in neuroscience where she discovered ketone bodies and their potential therapeutic use in neurological disease. Um, she attribute, attributes this finding to turning around her chronic migraines and changing her life for the better. So she initiated and funded the first clinical trial using exogenous ketone body salts, uh, which we'll hear more about later, as her PhD project at the University of Basel and Harvard Medical School. And she later founded the company Keto Swiss um, with the goal to bring exogenous ketone bodies to other patients for migraines and other applications. Um, so Elena's research has been published in journals such as Nature Neurology in the areas of ketosis, ketogenic diets, energy metabolism, neurological diseases, migraines in particular, clinical trials, and metabolic therapies. And she has a um, BSc in psychology, a master's in neuroscience, and a PhD in clinical research. So she's very well-rounded and educated. Um, she's also the author of two patents relating to BHB and migraine applications. Um, you know, so... We're talking to the right person for migraines, and I don't know of anyone else um, in the world um, carrying out this type of work in relation to ketogenic diets. So I think you are the one and only. Is that correct, Elena? I don't think. Uh, I think it's not 100% correct. Okay, There's cool. One person in, from Italy who's done uh, the ketogenic diets in migraine, who stumbled across this accidentally 2014 already. Oh, wow, in, cool. In a diet clinic, actually, for weight loss, and uh -huh. uh, realized that his migraine patients just lost their migraines with the weight. And so uh, he's, a, he's a colleague of mine and he knows nothing about exogenous ketones, but he knows a bit about ketogenic diets and migraine and he's a neurologist. So I'm not the only one. Okay, fantastic. Was that the case study I noted when you referred to in one of your reviews, I think? Maybe with ketogenic yes, diet actually, patients? Yes. Meanwhile, it's not only case studies. So there's mm. actually um, uh, even a placebo controlled bigger study now that he's done. Mm. Uh, using formulas, ketogenic formulas and low calorie formulas in, in, in migraine and uh, yeah. with very good results. And I think that's one of your questions. So we'll come back to that. Yeah. And if you want to see, I well, excellent. So what, what's his name for if anyone wants to look into his work too? Um, his name is, wait a second, it's uh, Di Lorenzo and his first name, he's an Italian guy. Uh, Ruberio, I think, but it, I'm bad with Italian. Okay. So well, well, so we'll work on the notes <laughs> afterwards, uh, yeah. you know, to make sure everyone has Di Lorenzo, notes and stuff. So then Di Lorenzo and Migraine, you'll find him. He's in Rome. Okay, excellent. All right. Yes, I can. Well, so to, to get started, um, let's just dive in at the top level um, into migraines and brain energy, energy metabolism. So um, first of all, I know some people may just, you know, be interested in headaches and may not actually know the difference between migraines and headaches. So I thought there was a good place to just start is what is a migraine? How does it differ from headaches or are these similar? Okay. So I think there's some overlap always, but uh, a typical headache is a tension type, it's called tension type headache in the medical world. And that's yeah. usually, we all have it, it's pressure on all of your skull basically, or, or it could be forefront, but it's typically both sides and it's more a pressure pulsating pain. Whereas migraine is typically unilateral, so one-sided. Uh, it's moderate to severe. It lasts between four and four, 72 uh, hours so that's between four hours and three days yeah um, it's more burning pulsating in quality and it comes with a lot of associated sim symptoms such as a third of a patient gets something called an aura phase which is a phase of visual or even sensory disturbances that can mm -hmm. go all the way to from blackening of parts of the visual field or um or sensory stimuli coming into the visual field all the way to numbness of half of your body oh wow that's an aura phase uh, it can also be impairment of speech, mm -hmm. and then it comes with light sensitivity, noise, sem noise sensitivity, um, smell sensitivity sometimes, and uh, nausea. Some people throw up. Uh, it has to be aggravated when you're moving, mm -hmm. and so when you when you walk in, it's worse. With tension type headache, usually go for a walk; it's better. 
the more you move with a migraine, the worse it is. So you really have to go into a dark room. Most people rest, um, don't move, uh, not talk and so on. So um, it's, it's definitely worse than, than the classical headache. And the easiest way, there is bilateral migraine. So it can be both sided, but typically it's not. And if then also light hurts and sounds hurts and movement makes it worse, then you're, um, you probably have a migraine. Interestingly, right. migraines are more related to epilepsy genetically than they are to a normal tension type headache. Wow. So it's, it sounds like there's quite a clear diagnosis for migraines versus headaches. Um, is, that, is that where yeah. we're at this stage? Yes, but the problem is that GPs, I mean, if you look at your stan standard medical student or medical education, mm -hmm. six years of medical school, you only get one hour of migraine, um, of migraine uh, teaching training. And yeah. training and four hours of uh, headache training oh, wow. in all of the six years. Uh -huh. And I think 30% of the people that come to a GP these days have migraine, but you're just not taught on it. So it could be that your GP you're going to actually does not really know how to classify migraine, potentially just because there's almost no teaching on it. Yeah. So, that's, that's a shame because you, you know, reading one of your papers, I read that, you know, basically you cited that there were 17% of women in Europe who suffered from migraines, which sounded like a crazy large number to me. It's, it's huge, yeah. Uh, every seventh person, right? It's, it's yeah, crazy. I know. So it's the, third, the third most common disease in the world, mm -hmm. just after tension, hepatic, and dental carriers. And it's the most common neurological disease in the world. And still there's literally no teaching on it because it's, not, it's still not thought as very important. Times yeah. are changing. But I think in the 80s, it was, um, or 60s, it was still classified as hysteria because mostly women get it. So. Right. Yeah, and I, I remember the first time I learned the word migraine when I was six years old. I, I know there's probably not a lot of Germans here, mm -hmm. but uh, we had this movie called Pünktchen and Anton. It's a famous kids movie, a German kids movie. And the protagonist's mom has migraines. And his friend asks the dad, what are migraines? And the dad says, migraines are headaches that don't exist. So <laughs> for the next 10 years, I thought that my, the word migraine means it's faking a headache. Oh, wow. And then I had them myself and I figured, oh, they're really actually quite real. It's not a fake headache at all. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a stigma it still has sometimes. Yeah, um, it, it seems to be quite uh, badly understood. Um, but it, it sounds like it's very, it's very common. So, I mean, just for the people at home, because I'm sure some of them have headaches and migraines and, and that's part of why they're on here. What, how, how would they know the difference? Is there any, like, based on what you've learned? Are they, are they kind of, is it based on the symptoms that you've described? They're basically more extensive than just the headache itself and the unilateral part. Is that how they could tell if it's a migraine versus a headache? Uh, I, think, I think you definitely have to have something like a noise sensitivity, light sensitivity. So if you feel like noise and light is really, uh, really not nice for you or yeah. smells, smells get more severe and they really bother you. Right. And then you move and it gets really worse. Like you, you tilt your head a bit like sinusitis and then everything gets worse, like a burning liquid. And it's like it sounds like you have experience almost, with this. <laughs> it's almost certain. I mean, the one-sidedness is basically migraine. Mm. But okay. there is rare cases where you have uh, two-sided migraines as well, mm. which is when you have to look out for these other symptoms. Do I, do, does light bother me? Um, and, and, and those things. Does it get worse? Do I get nausea or not? Yeah. With attention hepatic also, it's also when you can fall asleep, and it gets better, it's not a migraine. With a migraine, typically, you cannot fall asleep. It only gets worse. So it's All impossible right. to sleep. You wake up from sleep with a migraine. Ouch. With a tension type headache, you go for a walk, you go for sleep, you drink some water. All of this is useless with migraine. So I feel like if you have my, had migraine or these bad headaches, you probably already know. Or at least right, because it's know. so severe that you it's would know the severe. difference. It's not like you can, yeah, you can not wonder what's going on yeah and how fr how frequent is it for most people or is there any um, statistics you know of that um so that's a tough question i know that for one to two percent of the population so yeah. that's um that's that's about yeah one fifteenth of the migraine populations it's chronic migraine so it's still mm -hmm. a lot of people that's more that more people than have epilepsy so yes yeah, so, 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 so i mean more like so if you have a migraine like how often would you expect to experience it so a good fraction actually mm. have it uh, more than 50% of the time, but some people only get it once a year. Oh, so the you're saying is, like half of the know. days of a month, for example. Yes, that's, wow. that's uh, one to 2% of the mm. world's population are almost in pain all the time. Interestingly, I believe that every one of us has the mechanism of a migraine attack built in. It's an evolutionary adaptive mechanism. So some person, just the threshold for the migraine is individual. 
Mm. So some people might never get it. Some people might get one migraine in their lives. And some people might have it once a year. Some people might have it every day. And some people just, I mean, the most commonly you have it a few times a month, women around the period or whatever. But I can't really say, I'm not even sure it's known because there's no classification for different frequency. There's just chronic migraine and there's yeah. episodic migraine. And I don't think everybody, anybody really knows how common is what, but it's probably just a normal distribution of some sort right. in, in those migraine days. But the thing is, everybody can get it. And some people only get it when they have like an accident with their head. You know, they have an, yeah, a crash of some sort and then they get a migraine once in their lives. Right. But the, the migraine mechanism, I think, is evolutionary and it's built in to protect yourself from energy deficit and increased oxidative stress in the brain. A migraine wow, so forces you to have energy conserving behavior, right? Mm -hmm. You go to a dark room, you, you don't eat, you, you rest, you don't move. You, you can't see, you can't hear, right? So it's really forcing you to rest until energy homeostasis is restored. Yeah. And I think that's what migraine is. It's protecting us, not harming us, even if it feels horrible. It's okay. a warning mechanism. Yeah. And so you say sometimes people uh, can experience them later in life. Um, you mentioned once, you know, maybe they just experience it once as a protective mechanism or, you know, or maybe they didn't experience it when they were young and it would start. So it's, it sounds like it's all over the place, you know, but it can come at different times. And yes. I mean, there, it's more likely that you get it when you're young. I mean, women, also women get it more, but in childhood, mm. uh, it's 50, 50 male females. Yeah. Once puberty hits, it's more common in females. Um, with guys, it gets better in their late twenties, early thirties with women. It usually gets worse in their reproductive years and then it gets mm. better with menopause. So the typical migraineer with some genetic and environmental input will have it more regularly. But there is people that have never had a migraine, maybe ha don't have migraine running in their family, and then they have an accident and then they get a migraine attack for a few days. Great. So you just and mentioned some environmental inputs. Um, so people often, as I understand it, call uh, these migraine triggers. Like there's, yes. there's a number of migraine, tr migraine triggers that um, actually doctors also speak about. So... Um, do, you, do you call them migraine triggers yourself when you're looking at this and, and how it works? Yes. I mean, migraine triggers, usually I used to look at those uh, seemingly unrelated factors and was like, what do they have in common? My yeah. is completely random. I mean, it can mm. be strenuous exercise. We hear a lot. A third of the migraineers have exercise as a trigger factor. Weather changes, low pressure, for example, hypoglycemia, so skipping a meal is very commonly reported. Too little sleep, but then also too much sleep can cause it. Intense sensory stimulation even, for example, that can cause epilepsy as well. This stro uh, stro so maybe going to a club or something like that? You yes, mean? exactly. That, that yeah. light, that flashing light, uh, yeah. hypoxia, lack of oxygen. Right, so if you go up a mountain or you go in a plane. Exactly, yes. Lack of oxygen, yeah, altitude is a, is a very reliable trigger for migraines, actually, as an exercise. Yeah. And then alcohol, and some say other food sources. So you look at these and you think, what do they have in common? But actually, it's quite remarkable that the common denominator of all these seemingly unrelated trigger factors yeah. is oxidative stress. They can all increase oxidative stress. Exercise does that, low pressure, mm -hmm. uh, too much to little sleep because you're not eating, or hypoglycemia. You, um, hypoxia, you don't get oxygen in your, in your mitochondria. That causes the same stress, is also stressful. Physical or uh, psychological stress is both increasing oxidative stress. Alcohol is intense sensory stimulation. And some report even from perfumes or strong odors, they get that too. But yeah. a lot of perfumes come with toxins. Right. So the, so the idea is that these triggers cause oxidative stress, which is the common factor. Yeah. You know. yes. um, so is that... Is that or energy deficit uh, directly with okay. hypoxemia. And, right. and then oxidative stress can cause an energy, energy deficit, deficit as well? Exactly, exactly. So I can, I can even illustrate this on a slide, but I'm not sure we can also just keep talking. But there are several, mechanistically you can explain how these things can actually trigger the pain pain causing peptide release right. lead to the migraine and its resolution. So it's really quite interesting. There's a lot of speaking Toward and, an adaptive mechanism. And and did you, you what, did you review the papers to pull this framework together, linking this all together, or have other researchers done that and you and you are leveraging some of that? No, that was actually well. There's some people who have connected uh, mitochondrial functioning and migraine before, but yep. this adaptive um, mechanism pulling all the the mitochondrial energy deficit oxidative stress together with this adaptive idea, we did that in this Nature Neurology review uh, right. with colleagues. So um, this is a little technical, but I'm not sure if some people might be interested in this. 
Um, we can have a look at one slide if you like. I mean, shall I put it up? I'll, I'll try yeah, it. put it up. If you want to look at this. This is a little technical here, um, but we can, we can maybe start, start with this one where you can see how, how glucose deficiency or energy deficiency can lead to a migraine. It's, it's several, several. Are you factors. able to magnify the pathways one maybe? Is it, the, is it the one with blue? Is that showing the pathways, how they link yeah, up? This is, this is the pathways, exactly. Whoa, wait. But it's a little bit hard to understand. Let me make this a bit bigger so people can see better. So here you can see if you have a migraine trigger, the trigger we just reviewed, and you have a genetic predisposition, this is typically in hyperexcitable brain, which is adaptive for several reasons. But a hyperexcitable brain also means that it's usually on a constant basis eating up more energy. And that's just because it doesn't habituate, it doesn't rest. So a migraine's brain tends to be hyperactive, a bit like an epilepsy brain, which has good and bads to it. Uh, migraines can be perfectionist and so on. So if you have both of these, migraine triggers, they increase oxidative and nitrosative stress. They also decrease cerebral ATP. So this is your energy deficit here in the brain and glycogen in the brain, which is very finite. So this is the glucose storage capacity of the brain. And both of those um, basically also exacerbate each other. Then three lines of things happen. Mm -hmm. On the right side, you can see that now, okay, these, uh, these channels here are activated and they're releasing peptides. CGRP is the most commonly known one in, in migraine, but these are basically things that when they're released, they hurt. They're released, they bind to certain receptors, and this, this is what pays, right? And so this leads to the migraine and symptoms, and then also um, in the end to these energy conserving behaviors. Now, when it hurts and you're sick, you do exactly what you do with a migraine. You withdraw until uh, energy homeostasis is reserved, uh, preserved. So this is one of your adaptive mechanisms. Now, in the middle, something else happens. You will again have these pro-inflammatory uh, peptides and uh, increased um, Cere uh, cerebral excitability, so this just means increased excitability in the brain. And then this cortical spreading depression happens as well. Now, this is something that the people with an aura face we talked about have. So they have visual, if you have visual disturbances and all these things, that this is a, basically, you can think of it as a wave of electricity traveling over your cortex in the back where your visual center is, um, almost like a wave. And because this is so exhausting for the brain, it leads to depression afterwards. So it's almost like an electricity cut. So after that, nothing happens for a while. And this is how you lose sight or you lose uh, the ability to move part of your body or you lose the ability to speak is because this wave is traveling and, um, and basically stopping this part. This is not the most, uh, this is just for the aura patients, but this here is, is a good thing as well. This, this, these pro-inflammatory peptides that are released have something else that they do. They're basically antioxidant. Now that means they're not only causing you to rest and causing pain, but they're also part of getting rid of the, on, uh, of the oxidants that are harming you, the free radicals. And we have some modern medication, CGRP monoclonal antibodies that stop, block the action of CGRP, but CGRP is also part of the resolution. And now for you, probably the most interesting part is the left part here, where we have uh, increasing cortisol, temporary insulin resistant, which here is adaptive, not malfunctioning. And basically what that does is it leads to increased lipolysis. So your fatty acids are broken up. You're actually turning on ketogenesis during a migraine attack and uh, your glucose levels remain more or less stable because cortisol is increased as well. So you're kind of also attacking the energy deficit at the same time as you're removing the oxidative stress and you're forcing the body to rest. So this is why we're arguing that these trigger factors via these mechanisms are actually leading to the resolution of the, uh, of the attack. Great, so the, the trigger factors are sort of like demands on your energy metabolism from different vantage points. And, yeah. and basically the migraine, the pain forces you to slow down and yes. uh, to do things that conserve energy. Exactly, okay. everyone has a different threshold because they have better if you have a good energy metabolism it takes a lot of stress to mm. come into your system to actually hit that threshold of energy harmful energy deficit or mm -hmm. harmful oxidative stress levels right so so your main argument is that it's all about brain energy metabolism is that correct and uh, yeah if you in, if you include oxidative stress and free radicals into that then i would say yes but not always 
So mm. I think that's about 20%, maybe 30% of migraine patients. Okay. And metabolism is not an issue at all or almost not at all. They are just those hyperexcitability patients. Hyperexcitability is their, is their only problem, I think. So that's what um, preliminary... And, and, and how is that different? Is, it, is, is that more, is that the one where you were talking about hypersensitivity to, for instance, light and sound in clubs, like we mentioned? I think that's uh, also implicated in all because that's again energy deficit if, if okay. you cannot habituate mm -hmm. i mean what is expensive in your brain actually 50 percent of energy metabolism in the brain goes for to housekeeping tasks okay so and that means for example for you in order for you to think a thought or lift a finger or whatever you're doing in order for a neuron to fire there's electrical currents running through the brain and they depend on a so-called action, uh, these action potentials depend on a resting membrane potential. Sounds complicated. This is basically like, um, like, um, like something stopping water. I don't know how you call this dam. Is it called dam? Yes. Uh, or a wall that keeps out the water, a dam, right? Yep. And this dam has to be high enough so the water doesn't always flow over. But this is, uh, this dam in the brain is basically uh, kept up with energy. It's, it's pulling up uh, ions out against their concentration gradient to basically keep this membrane potential or the, the dam high enough so that an action potential only happens when it's really meaningful, when there's enough uh, input. But this membrane potential, keeping that up, is very energy intensive, takes up 50% of the energy demand in the brain. If you, have, if you don't have enough energy to keep up the dam, it's going to be reduced, which means that now the water can flow over very easily. And this water flowing over is an actual potential happening. And this means your brain gets hyper excitable if you don't have enough energy. Now, a hyper excitable brain means that in, it, with benign stimuli, you just react way more. So that means now a, a light ray that only usually causes a light, stim, like light stimulus, right? Or light action potential response, whatever, now gets a dramatic response. So now normal light is super bright for you. Normal sound is super loud just because it, your neurons go like crazy. The same is for smell. This is my explanation for this phenomena. They all get it. But um, if you have a purely hyperexcitable uh, brain migraine, that just means they have uh, certain types of ion channels. Now this is getting again complicated. Yeah. Ions again- Is that more genetic? Would that be more yeah, genetic? That's probably more genetic. And yeah. that just means they're constantly in hyperexcitability, mm. irrespective of the height of the dam. They just have genetically lower dams. Right. That's maybe. And so they're basically in trouble all the time. Is there any way for people to, to differentiate themselves from that? Might be too tricky. Or... Again, I would know. Again, the, your trigger mm -hmm. factors are probably your best guess. Let me, let me find a, a slide that has some trigger factors on them so you can maybe uh, see what the classical trigger factors would be. Um, so you can check your trigger factors. And uh, that's, I would usually do that. If you have any of those, those are the ones, the main ones, I would say, that are, that are related to energy metabolism. You can ask yourself, if you're a migraine patient who has had migraine for a while, what yeah. are your typical trigger factors? If it's one of these, those are related to energy metabolism. Okay, just to, just, to call, yeah, just to call those out quickly because they they're a little bit small. Oh, yeah. So it's uh, strenuous exercise, hyperglycemia, weather changes, too little or too much sleep, hypoxia, intense sensory or uh, odory uh, uh, stimulation, alcohol or stress. Okay, and, and that's all energy. And that's right. That is all energy metabolism related, especially if you cannot fast, if you cannot go long without water, if you uh -huh. struggle to do exercise, exercise, you have to remember a migraine typically is about eight hours delayed to the trigger. Right. Now the trigger effect can even be the day before. This is really hard. So this is why finding your trigger factors is tricky. And the threshold always varies in, in females, especially with hormones in the background. Mm -hmm. So um, at a certain time in your period, when estrogen, for example, is high, then your uh, tendency to get a migraine is way lower because estrogen is protective. It's antioxidant. Um, so you can sometimes get a migraine with exercise and sometimes not. Doesn't mean it's not a trigger. Just means that you're, um, yeah, you're, how do you say your resilience changes during the months but um, if you do this for a few months and you really wait for it know that your trigger factors are typically eight hours four eight to up to 24 hours before the migraine comes then you might be able to find a pattern here great all right perfect and i understand people keep diaries and and, th and things like that to try and figure this out um so it can, it can be quite tricky right 
um, because sometimes there's a lag as well. Yeah. And the problem is, you know, uh, there's so many things that people say could be a trigger that in the end you always find something always that could be a potential trigger. Mm -hmm. I remember the days where I was um, trying to figure out if cheese or chocolate or these things are related to migraine and you go crazy because, and then there comes a guilt component, big guilt part where you think, oh my God, now I ate a piece of cheese, now I have this migraine, it's all my fault. Um, so dietary sources, I think is probably not as common as we think that they cause migraine, mm-hmm. but some people might actually be gluten intolerant or dairy intolerant, right. or which could trigger inflammation and therefore, and therefore yeah, it's exactly. one of your and triggers there. Stress, and there we go. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, so, I mean, if people, so have you now found it simpler just to look back at these? So, you know, um, if you ever have a, a migraine again, do you kind of look at this framework here and be like, oh, yeah, which, so- which ones of these are adding up to this? So for me, it's usually, I mean, I'm heavy metal toxic. I know this now. So whenever I do detox for heavy metals with medication, at the end of this phase, I always get a migraine because heavy metals are the most pro-oxidant things on earth. So that's typically the only thing mostly that can cause a migraine with me nowadays. Otherwise, it's usually a combination of things like little sleep, alcohol, travel, and stress at work. And then I still get it. But these days, I typically know, okay, this is what you've done and this is why you're getting, well, I know even before I get it that I'm right. Right. You're like, Oh, oh I'm on the edge here. I'm uh, stacking okay, triggers. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's probably going to be it. But then sometimes it's worth it. You know, I have maybe two days of <laughs> grain a month uh, left or maybe three, not even sure. And then yeah. if it's my, around a period, it's more likely, but um, it's really manageable. So I don't, but it's, for me, it fits perfectly, but I know I'm a metabolic migraine type. I know my, my grandma has it, had it. I know it's mitochondria related. My mom also has, Probably will have problems with Oakley. So for me, it makes perfect sense and it's basically figured out. Yeah. But for somebody who might still be looking for it, I mean, you can also just do the test, like do high intensive interval training. If you feel like super rubbish after, there you go. Um, that's, that's the most poisonous. Uh, anything high intensive causes the most oxidative stress and will lead to collapse after and typically a migraine. Mm. Um, so exactly what everybody says you should be doing with a migraine typically uh, is not a good idea. Also fasting, prolonged fasting, causes migraine in almost everyone, unless they're super keto adapted. Um, migraines have something uh, called a gly- glucagon resistance, which is basically the opposite of insulin resistance, which is quite interesting. Uh, gl- glucagon is basically the counterplay to insulin that ensures you have enough energy when you're fasting. And uh, migraines can be resistant to that. So it's almost like they're overdoing the fasting all the time because right. they're always in this energy. So, so- Prolonged fast would be five days or, or more. No, like, um, um, like not eating for 16 hours could be a prolonged fast for my Oh, for someone from a migraine hour. Yeah, yeah. just 16 hours like skipping would trigger. One, like skipping one oh, right. breakfast can be it. Okay. Unless they're on a ketogenic diet and then things change. But not for all. Some can't even fast right. on a ketogenic diet. Okay. Because well, their mitochondria Let's... cannot uh, sustain. Either their liver isn't good enough to um, sustain energy metabolism or their, um, yeah, their fat oxidation isn't good enough, their policies isn't good enough, they don't have enough glucagon or they're resistant to glucagon. So there's several reasons why fasting in a migraine patient could be a bad idea. But that's why I always say the best thing is listen to your body. Everyone's different. Just because people tell you high intensive interval training is the best thing. I mean, I tried for years and I was dying after literally. It's not for me. I'm genetically not meant for this sport right um and if you feel rubbish after fasting then you're not ready there. you're not ready yet if it feels really really bad then it's probably not a good idea currently something's yeah. going on right no. so uh, we have this in some patients i guess that that is not great and most of them in the research also they know if they don't eat a meal they they get hypoglycemic and they feel really bad and then they get a migraine later on great caffeine can be a trigger for the same reason be- because because of the glucose effect or because caffeine stimulates cortisol then you uh you produce glucose right temporarily and then it, it dips again right. when the so hyperglyc- the hyperglycemic effect hyperglycemia is an issue yeah okay. and um, what we also find in migraine is this um delayed hyperglycemia or hyperinsulinemia you can call it as well it's like the thermostat in the migraine is broken Usually, right, you, you eat some food, your body analyzes how much glucose is coming. It then sends out the right amount of insulin to remove exactly the amount of glucose you've eaten, and then you're back to baseline. In the migraine, the insulin comes too late. It's like a sluggish system. 
It doesn't exactly know how much glucose is coming, it reacts too late, then is panicking, and then sends out too much insulin, and then you get a glucose dip after that is undershooting the glucose level you had before, and then it's like a roller coaster. Then you're starving, you eat again, you get shaky, and so on. Uh, so that's another common problem in migraine that you can maybe circumnavigate with, with um, with a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet. Right. So, uh, talk, moving moving to the ketogenic diet um, because this seems does seem to help. Uh, what kind of evidence is there that it reduces migraines? Um, let me see. Am I still sharing this? No. No. I mean, so part of, part of what you were saying, it, it sounds like it's, it's basically by regulation of uh, fuel, right? So whereas yeah, you get hyperglycemia. We, when, so when right now, not, I think there's five lines of evidence that we, uh, in general, like meta-level evidence, and uh -huh. then there's uh, more evidence in between. So we have shared pathophysiological mechanisms between the mechanisms that are causing migraine and the things that we do that ketone bodies are doing. Mm -hmm. And we have a very efficacious ketogenic diet studies in migraine patients, actually three, and we can go through them quickly. Then we have pilot data on, on exogenous ketones that we have uh, collected. And then um, let me just check. I can with my screen. Um, we have patents that show that this is working. And we also have case reports of uh, people reporting this. Um, so here you can see the things we know that are contributing to migraine. It's uh, inflammation, neurogenic inflammation. We have increased reactive oxygen species, decreased glucose in the brain, 20% decrease of ATP even between attacks in the migraine brain. That's pretty massive. We have this cortical spreading depression phenomena we talked about. We have mitochondrial dysfunction. Glucose transport is inhibited. We have this increased excitability phenomena. We also have problems with microbiome and digestive health. So these are the things we've already touched upon uh, just now. And then if you think about what DBHP, so the primary ketone body in the body can do, it can positively influence all of these mechanisms. Now we already said, so uh, ketone bodies can help because they're this alternative, more effective energy substrate for the brain. So they do have this metabolic action, which we see here, ATP, glucose, directly metabolic, but there's also other mechanisms, at least six other mechanisms where it's more a signaling molecule almost like a hormone. So it changes gene expression and all of these things. So um, this is something a bit more here maybe. You see here's a glucose transport uh, mechanisms, for example, this is the brain. This is the blood brain barrier. Glucose needs to be shuttled into the brain actively, mm -hmm. otherwise it doesn't pass through. So the brain is shielded with the blood brain barrier and only a very small molecule such as uh, oxygen can diffuse through. Everything else needs to be transported. And he, here we have these different transporters, even water needs to be transported. And one of the things that needs to be transported is glucose. Now, if this is defect or if this is not functioning in the patient, then ketone bodies use a different transporter so they can still be shuttled in. Now this is the brain level, and then we have the neuron or the astrocytes, some of the brain cells. They again have a membrane and again need to transport things in. Now here we ha again have problems with glucose sometimes. So if glucose transport is an issue, again, ketone bodies and lactate. So why would uh, glucose transport be an issue? That's genetic. So okay. um, genetic and also um, this can be due to the things you eat. So uh, there's also um, how many of these transporters are expressed depends on the things you eat and of course your genetics. So it could be a genetic issue or it could be an environmental issue as well. So for example, in the presence or in the context of a ketogenic diet or low carb diet, more GLUT1 transport um, molecules or transporters would be expressed and put into the membrane. Yep. But if you're constantly having glucose high, then, you, then the body puts mm. less transporters in because it doesn't yep. want to oversaturate the brain with, with sugar, right? So it's, it's all a mixture of nature nurture in that sense. So, and um, then again here in, in the neurons, also insulin resistance is a problem. So we can mm -hmm. have insulin resistance irrespective of in the brain, irrespective mm. of the body. So that's what can happen in Alzheimer's. Type yeah, so I see a relevant question. Actually, someone just asked if uh, Alzheimer's patients yeah. are more susceptible to migraines. And when you were talking about the glucose transporters, um, have you seen any links there? You know, Stephen Cunan's I research? Think, I think it's the other way around, because mm -hmm. typically migraine would come first and then Alzheimer's. So I think migraineurs have an increased risk for Alzheimer's. Right. But an Alzheimer's patient, I'm not sure if you can ask if they have an increased risk for migraine because the migraine would have happened earlier in their life. You know, typically. Right. 
so basically they oh. they can they can appear together um yes. they're correlated so the, the, yes yes i think if you have migraine your alzheimer's risk is increased and that makes sense right Right. Mitochondria play an issue, insulin resistance, all these things. So again, if you have insulin resistance, uh, your, your migraine, uh, your um, ketone bodies can still fuel the brain. Also, they're antioxidants, so there's less oxidative stress and there's other things going right. on. So, how, how are, so basically, one of the principles here is that uh, ketone bodies are able to bypass some of the mechanisms that aren't working so well for glucose transporters um, so that the brain can get yeah. access to the energy. So energy, and then also they're antioxidants. So they're also kind of like signaling molecules. They catch free radicals. And when you burn them, they produce less oxidative stress. You also need less oxygen when you burn ketones. They're also more efficient. So per oxygen molecule consumed, you, pr you produce more ATP. So they're a more clean fuel source. Um, they also lead to uh, more mitochondrial uh, biogenesis. Yeah. So more powerhouses in the cells are built. They're anti-inflammatory. So again, a signaling action when BHP is high, then inflammation is, uh, is regulated down. Mm -hmm. um, then we have uh, decreased hyperexcitability in the brain. Also, yeah. very different mechanisms. Uh, five different ones are known, how ketone bodies can actually reduce hyperexcitability in the brain via ion, ion channel changes and glutamate transport and these things. I have slides for that too. Um, you asked about the ketogenic diet. Now here you can see, for example, one of the three studies that was done, yep. this is the time they were in ketosis. You can mm -hmm. see the difference. All of them, standard diets, all of them were losing weight. This is also weight loss. But only in the period they were in ketosis, they uh, reduced their migraine frequency, severity, and medication use to uh, by 75%. That's wow, better so than any that's prevention we have. That's, that's, very sig yeah, that's very significant. What, what are the second two graphs? Um, what are the... Uh, What's it, uh, yeah, just one. You got three, three yeah, graphs there. Is, uh, attack frequency, take some migraine and tablets intake. Okay, anyway, 75% is, is a very large yeah. uh, And we percentage. have more trials like that. Mm -hmm. um, this is another one, very mm -hmm. significant. Days, attack frequency, and attack duration before and during. So again, uh, there's quite some evidence. This is just changes. And then we have, uh, even with the exogenous ketones, we have some data that suggests it's looking pretty good um, about yeah, up to 65% reduction with exogenous ketones. It's just one month. It's not placebo controlled. So should be this very preliminary data should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but that's, that's some more data. And, and what type of exogenous ketone was in that particular study? So, yeah, this is, this is the more relevant slide. We have, um, this is the racemic, and we can go through that too. Racemic salts, beta-hydroxybutyrate, beta which is the primary ketone body, in mineral salt form, but unfortunately, this was still the racemic, meaning that it has the left and the right spinning version of the molecule. I'm not sure if you are aware of that, but you might remember from your, from your chemistry class that basically any molecule that has different functional groups, meaning different ingredients, like your fingers on your hands, um, ha can have a different orientation in space that can never align like your fingers. They all have the same ingredients, but no matter what I do, right, I can never align them 100%. And that's true for, for a lot of chemicals. Now, if you work molecules, and if you produce them chemically in the lab, then the, the, which is the cheapest way, you synthesize them in the lab, then there's always 50-50% of both so-called stereo isomers. But your body is handed. Your body doesn't have both versions of a molecule because enzymes only can really lock onto one of the versions. Now for beta-hydroxybutyrate, this is the right spinning version, the right-handed version right. that is human identical. The racemic is, uh, is not natural in that sense that it, the body doesn't make it. When you were a baby, your body still makes LBHP and we don't mm -hmm. really know yet why, but when we're an ad adult, it's mostly DBHP. Now that doesn't mean that the L is yeah. poisonous, for us, we study with Yale. It's um, it is definitely in in three months. There's no signs of any toxicity or any any changes in, in safety markers. We already have that analysis, um, but it's not ideal because it's much less potent, and mm. it's actually only a third of the potency of having the DBHP only, which is. And, and when you say that, is that based on the millimolar increase of ketones yeah. from the same gram dose? Let me see if I can show you that too. Just, just for people, you know, at home. So racemic means both the L and the D. Um, and it's, you know, and uh, Ellen is talking about... And most competitors... 
Yeah, so salts which just have one of them. So if you know Keto Kana, which has been around for a long time, or the original Keto OS or Kigenics or any of those um, salts that were on the, on the market in the early days, they were all racemic, which means they had both the L and the D versions. Yes, Elena. Yes, and that's uh, still true for most of the products on the market. It's, it's improving now. So this is a graph where you can see the pharmacokinetics, as well as said, right? You get a peak with 10 grams of your racemic mix, mixed in LBHB of mm -hmm. about 0.6 millimole, which really is just barely cutting nutritional ketosis for about two hours. If you now give the D only, you can see it's, uh, it's three times the peak and it's elevated for much longer. Now, we were wondering why is that three times? It should be double. But right. it's probably that the L is also inhibiting the uptake of the D. Interesting. Um, so it's yeah. similar that it probably inhibits some of the transporters. And mm -hmm. this has been verified by other uh, labs. And there's another interesting effect if you look at uh, the effect on glucose. Now, if you have, if you give the DBH, uh, the, the receiving mix again, then you get quite a profound drop in blood glucose very quickly. And, um, and we had to give them food here so they don't go off the glycemic because they were not on a ketogenic diet. Whereas if we gave the D only, there was almost no effect on glucose at all. That's another interesting effect. So somehow the L seems to be lowering glucose. Because that, that's actually often you know, quite experienced. You also see that with MCTs, uh, that your glucose can lower uh, when you take them. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting that you know, the D doesn't do that. Uh, very cool. That's, that's interesting, yeah. So, um, so, you know, so basically you've, you've looked at some of the ways ketones might impact, you know, some of the mechanisms for migraines. Um, how about mitochondrial function? Cause I know that's, you know, something people think about. It sounds like you, you think that's part of your personal uh, problem that you had to tackle. Um, how could uh, ketones support mitochondrial function? Well, firstly, um, several ways, I guess, again. So mitochondrial function depends well, how well your powerhouses work. Typically, it depends also on the byproducts they make, uh, for one. And mm. that's uh, oxidative stress. Now, if you have oxidative stress, it's basically the three radicals that bounce around in your body. And whenever they hit, they cause damage. So they bounce uh, to the DNA, they bounce to uh, enzymes, proteins, and well, wherever they go, they basically uh, make whatever they hit malfunctioning or less functioning. Mm -hmm. Now, these are a big problem for the mitochondria to begin with. If they already inhibit your mitochondria, that means that they work less well. And that again means that they will, while they're making energy, they produce oxidative stress anyway. So that means that they're making more. It's like a vicious circle. If you have oxidative stress elevated, you make less ATP, you can, you can uh, again, your mitochondria perform less well, so they make even more oxidative stress, which inhibits their function further. Now, some of the things where ketone bodies can help here is one, they're antioxidants themselves. So they can bounce around catching free radicals themselves. Also, now when they're burned, they produce less oxidative stress compared to glucose. So they're cleaner fuel in that sense. And so it's kind of like two ways how, how burning ketones can help mitochondrial functioning. There's some evidence, I'm not sure how convincing that is, that more mm -hmm. mitochondria are built, but in a migraine patient, mitochondrial biogenesis doesn't really make so much sense. It only makes sense in a fit person where you can make even healthier mitochondria or more of them. If you have uh, super shitty mitochondria and right. more of them, it's kind of not- It might not be such a good idea. More. Exactly. Uh, it might cause more of a problem than actually be helpful. Exactly, I'm not sure how, how this is helping, mm. but uh, making more ATP also per oxygen, oxy, oxygen molecule consumed helps as well. Less oxygen, less oxidative mm. stress. Yep. Um, so these, these are the things how mitochondrial functioning, I think, could potentially be improved. And um, that doesn't mean that ketones are the, the all sole issue. You have to make sure your mitochondria are functioning by removing oxidative stress causes, such as heavy metals, by making sure that you have all the enzymes and cofactors that your mitochondria need to work. It's like putting the right oil in the car. Uh, so you need uh, B2, you need um, coenzyme Q10, you need alpha lipoic acid, you need so many things, a vitamin D, all those things that your mitochondria can actually work. Yeah. If you have a block somewhere in, in the in citric acid cycle or somewhere else, and you're not having enough of uh, your minerals or, um, or vitamins, then it wouldn't work either. So those things have to be um, managed as well. So ketones aren't the only answer but uh, certainly part of it, I suppose. Great. Um, so in comparison inflammation, someone just asked a question about the NLRP uh, free inflammasome. 
and ketone bodies and inflammation is is that the mechanism by which you think that might be supporting migraines i guess that's that's the that's the mechanism that we all know right as far <laughs> as the, well we think there isn't any specific research on that unfortunately yet so yeah. i can only guess and say yes but um that's a guess it's a guess yeah um that's great um, and the cerebral excitability, I understand there's, there's some changes that come about via GABA upregulation. Is that so? Yeah. Is that how that exactly. works? Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. So that's one of the ways I'm looking uh, at my slides. Uh, so for, for, for the audience, what is GABA and why is that the important? Equivalent, there, there's um, a mainly, there's several neurotransmitters in the brain, a lot of them, but uh, some of them that are really well known is GABA and glutamate. And they're kind of like um, enemies or counterparts. Uh, glutamate is uh, an excitatory neurotransmitter that makes your brain more likely to fire. GABA is more like the inhibitory neurotransmitter, which makes it more calm and relaxed. And they're synthesized out of each other, mm. which means they can interrelate, convert into each other. And what uh, the presence of ketone bodies does, or BHP is, it kind of shifts the equilibrium between the two, the balance, uh, in the direction of GABA. So more GABA is made in comparison to glutamate, and that calms things down. And then another thing that ketones do is they inhibit glutamate receptors or transport even. I think transport mm -hmm. receptors. So less glutamate is transported means it's less active everywhere. So that's another mechanism. And I think there's more um, with regards to hyperexcitability in the brain. And uh, that is one of the ways or some of the ways we think that ketogenic diet might help in epilepsy cases where yeah. hyperexcitability is a big issue, obviously. Yeah, fantastic. Let me see if there's any uh, uh, relevant questions yes, um, to what we've just been chatting about. Uh, so yeah, there's one on the isomers. Um, is one more prone to being converted to acetoacetate than the other? I don't think so. I don't actually know. I know that the that LBHB is converted into DBHB via, um, but BHB goes into acetoacetate anyway. So I think that LBHB will take a lot longer to get into acetoacetate compared mm -hmm. to DBHB. Um, so yes, I guess DBHB is closer to acetoacetate. It's like mm -hmm. one step away, more or less. Um, so I don't think it's LBHB, but it will get there eventually as well, I believe. And um, for us with the exogenous ketones, I can say that um, yes. we had about a two-third conversion to acetoacetate, which is not bad. Great. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, this L versus D. How, how advanced is the uh, research on that? You know, because I, I understand it's, it's relatively new, right? This discussion about L and, L and D isomers has taken place. And I know, yeah, do you I think there's a lot of work to do? That's what I'm asking. Like, is there a lot of work to do to investigate both of these to see what the differences are? Yeah, I suppose. Um, yes and no. I mean, we know that there is kids that have been taking the receiving for a while and they have not died. I believe it's maybe not um, a, a bad health consequence in the short time, but the problem was, I think the, the, the only reason for using the racemic is just because the DBHV wasn't available in any affordable price. And mm -hmm. now that synthesis is improving and DBHV becomes affordable, I don't think there's any way why we should use the racemic more yeah. often, unless, because we, we know with the mm -hmm lowering effect on then this is a cancer patient and we really find that this is way more effective than metformin as is most racemic we might be able to use that for um, for something like cancer more than we would for a different disease for neurological disease where fuel is the major issue i suppose i would always choose d over yeah. racemic if i had the choice just because if it's endogenous, we know it's safe in, in physiological ranges. If we use a racemic, we don't know what it's going to do 10 years down the line. We don't know what it's going to do with somebody with a certain genetic background. So I'd always prefer to yeah. be on the safe side. Right. And so you could say there's more uncertainty attached to racemics. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If you remember the Contagon scandal, you know, um, this has been the tranquilizer that's been given to, um, to pregnant uh, women 50 years ago. Oh, something. right. With the, uh, and they yeah. were all disabled. Oh, not all, but most of them were, were disabled. And the problem there was that the, one of the isomers uh, was actually uh, ah, to I didn't know that. babies, to unknown babies, unborn mm. babies. It was fine for the mother, but for unborn babies, the receiving yeah. mix was toxic. Yeah. Well, so, so, so it's interesting because there are other supplements on the market which are racemics for the same principles uh, you mentioned, economics, right? So if you look at alpha lipoic acid, they often it's racemic unless you look yeah. specifically for the R 
uh, mm -hmm. version, which is uh, the natural version. So this appears in other supplements as well. And, you know, it's something that people aren't that aware of. We have another question here. Um, mm -hmm. So this one, this is from Elena. And she says, the majority of the studies with ketogenic diet in migraine patients are performed with obese patients. Therefore, the results look promising for obese patients. A small subcategory of all migraine patients. What about all the others? So what, what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, that is true. And that's uh, because... I mean, this has been fairly old. Now it's recent as well. But you know that in the medical community, mm -hmm. a ketogenic diet is frowned upon for so many reasons. And, and also even that, that research is still, and, and the lab still thinks that you cannot give a ketogenic diet to somebody who is not obese because they will lose so much weight. And a lot of migraines are actually fairly skinny to begin mm -hmm. with. And they think you cannot maintain a ketogenic diet because it, mm -hmm. people tend to lose weight on a normal weight person, they're just scared of that. And also the ethics are scared of it. So it's hard to get the study approved. So the easiest way was just to look at it in obese people. Doesn't mean that the mechanisms here don't generalize. Yeah. Now we talked about the mechanisms, uh, the different mechanisms that we know are causing migraines and what ketone bodies are doing. And mm. that is not, insulin resistance actually in a migraine patient is probably yeah. more physiologic than, um, than it is maladaptive. So it's probably something that we want because what does it do? If you have insulin resistant, that means a certain type of tissue is insulin resistant. Now, if your muscles become insulin resistant, what does that mean? They're not taking up a lot of glucose. This spares glucose for the brain. So in a migraine patient, insulin resistant could actually be a protective mechanism to leave the little glucose that is there for the brain and not the muscles who can, for example, just metabolize some fatty acids, but the brain can't. So the energy situation of the brain is so special because first it cannot really store energy. So it's dependent on the, on the energy in the circulation. And secondly, it's, uh, it can only eat three different things, lactate, glucose, and ketones. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing it can feed off. Any other, other organ with the exception, maybe of the heart a little bit can also eat um, proteins, fatty acids, not that that all works. Yep. So, um, so that's why uh, insulin resistance is not always maladaptive in, in, in everybody. And the migraine patient could be uh, pro-adaptive. Yes, I know that the ketogenic diet mm -hmm. studies are only done on obese patients. Yep. Our study, which is uh, finished uh, soon, analysis is finished soon, although still with the racemic and not very potent, blah, blah, um, mm -hmm. that's going to be finished in a month or two. And that was done on non-obese migraine patients. So, but, um, but that was with exogenous ketones. Again, because the ketogenic diet several issues still in the medical community. Right, it's difficult. Right, so what people uh, might not know is sometimes it's difficult to get the ketogenic diet passed through um, ethics for approval for studies. So it could be a bit tricky sometimes. Have you had the same, um, is it easier with the study which you did with um, DBHB? Did you find it easier easier to get through? It was racemic, but it was still fairly easy. I was surprised okay. how it was, um, but it's Good. again, because we don't have to fast the people. We don't have to drastically change their diet. We right. just add something that mm -hmm. we think is safe and we had a, yeah quite like a 50 page analysis of all the pharmacokinetics and the metabolism and all the studies that existed. And by the second time it passed with medics approval cool. and ethic approval. So it was fairly easy to get that done and also fund it because people think that's a cool thing. If you can just uh, supplement ketones and then uh -huh, right, right. Natural, yeah. that's a cool thing. If you suggest a dietary study, they think nobody adheres to it. In the end, you don't have data. It's too hard. Nobody will do it and we won't pay for it. That's typically how it is. And you can control it. So, yeah, so it's easy to get funded and it was easy to get passed for ethics, which is good for the area of research. Um, so we got a, a pile of questions uh, pump, uh, piling up here. So um, I'd like to get into more of the uh, BHB salts. And yes. um, we've already talked about the different types of ketone salts currently available. Um, so w could you uh, be a bit more specific about the studies you've carried out with ketone salts and migraines and you know, explain what the goal was of the studies and what the results have been so far? Yeah, so let me share. I, I think you briefly showed a slide on this earlier. Yeah, so basically, yes, we have these ketone body salts. Now, I already mentioned this is basically the DBHB or mm. BHB could be racemic, so beta hydroxybutyrate molecule, which is negatively charged, attached to a, a cation of any sort. So, so this could be sodium, potassium, magnesium, or calcium, right? So we did so, that. So these are just for people who haven't tried these before, these are generally powders. Yes. Like you powder. take them in as a powder, you would mix them in some water or something like that. And we use those 
specifically 18 grams of that in our first uh, randomized con placebo control, double blind crossover efficacy mm -hmm. safety study in Basel in about 50 patients in the end with dropout it's now 40. Um, 18 grams per day, calcium, magnesium, just because, and the racemic, just because this has been started four years ago and there's mm -hmm. literally nothing else available, pretty much. Uh, the design looks like this. This is a typical crossover design. We have a run-in period where we record migraine days. Then you have an active intervention and a placebo. You have a wa washout period to get rid of any effects they might have. Second run-out period, run-in period in case people have seasonal migraines. Great. It's another baseline. And then we have, then we swap over to the other condition. Right. So, so for the people at home, like, so to do this, you know, to a lot of people at home, this is going to look like a complex study. So why did you design it this way? What is the, what are, what are the benefits of designing this way in terms of, you know, the data that you get out of it and the results? Yeah. So there's several benefits here. Um, usually it, the most powerful thing of a crossover design typically is, or, I mean, that might be straightforward is that basically a patient is his own control. Mm -hmm. So everybody's migraine are different. So, and, and uh, everybody's response to ketosis might be different and everybody's placebo effect is different. Some might have none at all. Some might have 30% of reduction in migraine just because they get to talk to someone like me every month. And uh, I don't know, they think they get something that helps, right? So having your own control increases statistic power, that statistical power. That's just, the, that's what it means. And then also we found one of the biggest effort, um, the biggest, um, point for this design actually is that so many more patients are motivated to do it if they know that for 100 percent they will get to try the active the, drug, the intervention right right versus they might be the, con the control who gets there might be 50 yeah. chance of a control and you mm -hmm. are in the study for six months that's just a waste of your lifetime so that helps to keep uh, you know that's why you got 40 people who yes. stayed in in the study helps to keep them motivated of mm -hmm. course though if they do get the active first and then they kind of know okay then they might <laughs> so it's like mm. it's not it's nothing is ideal but uh, you also need a run-in and uh, as i said in baseline just for for baseline comparison you need a washout period in case there's carryover effects so this was complicated so, yeah. it wasn't that easy to run mm -hmm. now one patient is in this study for nine months but okay. you also have um you do like a um I don't know how to say this in English, like a running, running um, recruitment. So it's not like everybody starts at the same time, but you have like 10 different groups of people that start at different times and mm -hmm. are then in the study at different times over the two or three years you're running the study. So it becomes quickly fairly complicated right. logistically who gets what. And, uh, but, but in general, this is just the, the way you do it. Um, double blind just means that neither I nor the patient know who's doing what, that all the ketone body finger pricks is done by a study nurse who then also don't know who it belongs to. Data entry is not done by me. Statistical analysis is done by the hospital and so on, right? Um, so, and randomized right. control is, is just that you randomize who's getting what when. Yeah. Like almost like a, like a draw. And this, and this, uh, you finished the data collection part in January. Is that correct? Correct. Or, um, well, we just finished, um, I think two months ago. Okay. So it was a little bit delayed again, Corona and whatever, uh, <laughs> but, course. uh, and now with analysis and we calculate these different things, effect, uh, placebo effect, we, we calculate as very big effects yeah. as very small dropout also 30% because of course it's a long study. The longer it mm -hmm. is, the more people move away or mm -hmm. lose interest. Incomes and exclusion, five to 14 days of migraines. I would stick with that. It's not yet chronic. Chronic patients are very comorbid and unlikely to respond to anything. But you also want to have migraine days so you can measure if, an effect. If you get two days of migraine one month and no migraines the other months, it's hard to know whether anything helps, right? So you need a kind of a... So you needed a consistent... Month. What it's saying there is you're, you needed consistently to get five to 14 days of migraines per yeah. month. Yeah. Otherwise, you're out. Yeah. And yeah. stable prophylaxis. So not just changing something else. Again, you want to mm. change one variable only. Mm. And this is why we, this is the good thing about using exogenous ketones. You all know if you do a ketogenic diet and you do it properly, you change so many variables at the same time. You're now eating real food. You're not eating all these uh, bad fatty acids. You're getting rid of glucose. You're getting rid of uh, carbohydrates. You might get rid of some food allergies. Um, you're now getting more proteins, you're getting more uh, nice fatty acids that you might not have got. So there's so many things to change at the same time. What you can do with an exogenous ketone study is you just change one thing, presence of ketones. That's it. 
So you can then measure the effect of what do ketone bodies themselves actually do and what is maybe due to the absence of glucose or the reduction in carbohydrates yep. and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what we're trying to, what we were trying to do. Primary outcome changes from number of migraine days compared to placebo. Secondary yeah. outcomes, we're looking headache days, intensity, acute medication, all these things. Some qualitative uh, factors. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, migraine it. disability. Right. So the main <laughs> thing you were looking for was a reduction in the number of days per month that people were suffering That's a migraine. Primary outcome. But then we're looking yeah. also for changes in inflammation, fat, glucose metabolism, protein metabolism, standard lab, safety lab, oxidative stress, nitrosative stress markers, those kind of things. Mm. Uh, maybe even genetic stuff if we have the funds left. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. So, so that's basically. So, when you're saying genetic, maybe uh, epigenetic. Is that what you're saying? Epigenetic changes. Epigenetics and uh, basically trying to predict genetically who is responding. Ah, responding. I see. Gotcha. So you right, can do cool. Genetics and epigenetics. Right. And are you allowed to share anything right now? Because I know, like, often you know, you're not allowed to share. Yeah, a lot right of now. I mean, I can, um, well, I can say it's, it's, I can already say it's not significant. It's only a trend just because it's not so many um, patients. Now everybody has to keep this to themselves because uh, that is a shame, but it's no surprise because the ketone body levels weren't super high. So that's not what we expected. There is a difference between the groups and we have 30% uh, super high responders, which is interesting too. Okay. Uh, they would be significant. And now we're trying to figure out what do they have in common? Is there a metabolic subtypes of yeah. migraines? Cool. And we also know there's literally no change in safety markers, even though they were pretty much all on a high carb diet. And that's oh, wow. important. Right. Cause well. you know, taking, taking ketone salts with high carb, you know, that's interesting. That's not, you know, something we've really looked into massively either, because I know there are some studies exactly. with MC, combining MCT with uh, glucose, which aren't necessarily uh, positive. Uh, we would say so yeah with mct definitely because i think the way mct still need to be metabolized and i think that metabolized differently in a high carb environment versus a low carb environment whereas with with ketone salts you have instant ketosis there's it's no a more direct way. yeah there's it's no conversion already there yeah. there's no different way you can kind of metabolize them because they're already mm. the end product yeah but um what is interesting also is the glucose lowering effect of those ketones mm. So maybe, I mean, there's three scenarios you can think of, right? The first one is uh, ketones and glucose is actually making it worse than just high glucose. The second is it doesn't really make a difference either way. Uh, and the third is it's actually better to have ketones elevated in a high carb state than just having high carbs. Right. Because it's, I mean, it is glucose lowering. So when you take mm. BHP on top of a high carb diet. Because, because this, is, this was a racemic one. So it, did, you were tracking the glucose as well? to see if that would yes. be lowering. Yeah, yes. cool. And, the, and the, I mean, gluconeogenesis, the mm. new building of glucose in your liver is reduced when mm. ketone bodies are elevated. So you're still taking in uh, glucose from outside, mm -hmm. but at least your body's now making less ketones on the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, glucose, sorry. So, so that means uh, total glucose levels are reduced. Do, are you allowed to tell us uh, what the, because you mentioned that the, BA, the, the ketone levels were relatively low? Sure. Yeah, so um, I don't have the uh, data back yet from the trial uh, on that, but from the pilot, we know it got to about a 0 0.6 on average. Okay, for so two it's, hours. yeah, it's re it is relatively and be, low. Um, mm. So, the, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's at the lower so end of a ketogenic diet. Back, so we have to do it again. We're going to repeat the trial to get the funds. Now we're doing three groups and we're also going to use a much, much more potent product. Some of you might know I'm with Keto Swiss now. I have my own company and we're making more potent ketone buddies. Um, and uh, they're- Right, great. So this was the, the next question. You have plans for additional studies and you do. Yes, exactly. That's true. We plan for different studies. It's going to be a study, uh, again, randomized control. I think we will not go for the crossover now, but three groups, different dose finding, which is mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. And if I can show you something. Yeah. Um, and this one's going to be using here. your DBHB. So just the D, is it? DBHB and also different pharmacokinetics. Now this is, I'm not sure. Can you see this? Let me see. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can see a graph. 
So here you can see placebo levels. Now this is measuring both ketone bodies in the, in the body. Usually if you do the finger prick test, you only test for BHP. We did a venous blood pharmacokinetic study, which means that you just analyze the ketone bodies from the blood, a bit more reliable. And that gives you the chance to was also- this, measure, you know, Was this an actual lab or you were using a meter but accessing via the, the vein, vein? No, 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 the, this is an actual, this is done in the hospital. Okay, so you're actually a lab, right? Taking from the- Control lab style, mm. they have- um, I don't know how you catheter there basically are, are being drawn blood every uh, half an hour to two hours, depending on the time and the study, the interval. Wow. Mm. So they were there uh, from the morning to the night and they were either getting a placebo, which was a bit of pea protein, or they were getting, or they were getting uh, our second product. So just a pure DBHP salt, which you see already looks pretty good compared to the receiving. Oh my God. So what, what does it hit just because it's kind of and smaller? Then, what, what number does it hit at the peak there? Oh, uh, this is 2.5. Okay, so with our product, this is our product, go to market. This is called MicroCat 4. Uh -huh. We hit 2 millimole for 12 hours without dropping with the same. Oh, wow. And is that a DBHP or is it something different? That is uh, the active ingredients is DBHP in different forms. Yeah. Okay. So it's that's, that's more like it, that's a composite uh, product. It's a bit more complicated by the sounds of it. Um, and then the... Um, but the, the good, I mean, I saw a question with gastrointestinal effects. We have complete taste masking. We have complete gastro gastrointestinal um, discomfort masking because this this uh, we are basically hiding the DBHP and other things, which enables this sustained right. Infusion it's sustained like release. Level. Is it like a sustained release? Like sustained release. Hmm. Um, something like a sustained release mechanism exactly mm. that can then lead to this uh, stable levels and you don't get gastrointestinal problems you also don't have the liver issues of an a keto ester because keto esters need to be metabolized obviously and uh, they're attached to butandiol which is an alcohol so ketone esters is like taking alcohol every day in quite large quantities so we don't have that. We still have the instant ketosis, but we also are making sure that your brain gets stable energy. Now yeah. for migraine patients, this is essential because they have to get through the night. Mm. That's the most stable so, effect I've seen from a supplement, right? Yes. Because we've it's done a lot of testing perfect. ourselves with you know the salts, the esters and everything. And you know that's definitely, I've never seen anything like that that goes on so long. So, because it's kind of small, how, how many hours it, duration is it in total? This is, this is here on, on this side, this is hitting 12, 12 hours. 12 hours. Yeah, wow. So it's still around 1.7 at 12 hours. That's crazy. Good um, job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that wasn't I. I just said, this is what I want. And then somebody smiled <laughs> yeah. and it out for me or with me. You, you, know? you found some, some crazy biochemist chemist uh, to figure it yeah, out. Yeah, I have some partners. Um, but this yeah. took like two years more. And it was still... Upscale, so it's not like we can hit that tomorrow. It still has to pass. Um, it's it still has to pass the upscaling phase, so um, it can still crash or not work. But fingers crossed. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm praying for this. But yes, yeah, so this can also be um, put in different uh, deliveries. It doesn't taste bad. It's uh, it's not a problem for your liver. You mm. can feed the brain all day. Now this is what we want to study in the yeah. next trial. Well, cool, cool. Like so, you know, I'd like to ask you. This is a fascinating question. I don't know. Like, I hope this isn't going to free for one, but um. You know, if you could design and fund the best ever study in this area to validate the benefits of ketones with migraines, what would you like to do? Like if there was absolutely nothing that was holding you back wow. to take this area forward. <laughs> if you don't have an answer, that's fine. Um, then I would probably, well, then it, you'd probably take not a few hundred patients, not just uh, like a hundred, maybe a few hundred, a hundred per arms. If you can, maybe 500 per arm. Then I would do um, probably dose finding. So I would uh, take different doses, 10, 20, 30, 40 grams. I would also have different arms for patients. So use lower frequency, higher frequency patient. I would have a, probably a metabolic subtype as classified with trigger factors, non-metabolic um, responder or a subtype of migraines. You could have episodic and chronic migraineurs. And then you'd give them basically the either the MigraCat 4 or the DBHB on its own. Mm -hmm. and then a placebo and ideally you can then do more groups even and combine them dbhp to a standard diet and uh, migrate forward to to a um, ketogenic diet and then have an 
only ketogenic diet group as well. So you could have like 10 different groups trying to figure out all these different tiny mechanisms. And then of course, double blind, randomized control and all this stuff. But uh, that would probably yeah, be a billions, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it'd be very cool. It, it might figure out a lot of things. I mean, it sounds like it would figure out the dose needed to resolve the migraines. Um, it would figure out which, which segments it would work, with which triggers it would work best. Um, if you could replicate it with a ketogenic diet or not, or you'd have to, you know, use the um, the particular supplement or not. That would answer a lot of questions. Yes, and then also uh, neuroimaging, of course, we do MRS, ma magnetic uh, resonance spectroscopy, which basically lets you measure ATP indirectly in the brain. So you can look at what is giving more energy as well as a marker, mm -hmm. as, a, mm -hmm. as an objective marker mm -hmm. um, that, that you could do too. Super expensive, but super mm -hmm. cool. So there's uh, so many things that one could do with money. Yeah, in absolutely. Area, in all well, more and more people are getting interested in this area. So um, I think it's going to get easier in the future as it proves itself. Um, so, you know, I think we've already covered this except for, um, you know, talking about the, the keto Swiss product itself, has it got a name, uh, yet, or like, what do you, do you call these? Cause it, you've got two versions of products there, as I understand it, the DBHB yes. and the other one, do they have oh, names so that, yeah. or how would you identify them? Yeah, we just got the MigraCat. MigraCat 4 is that one. And MigraCat okay. 2 is this one. MigraCat for migraine and keto. Okay, cool. So, and, and these are specifically going to be targeting migraines, uh, thus the name Migraket. Uh, exactly. That would have, but honestly, if we do a supplement, it would have similar ingredients and then it would call, be called Keto X or Ketonate for drinks. So we're planning to make a drink, a Ketonate. And the, the supplement powder would probably be Keto X. Excellent. Awesome. And Migraket would then be the medical product. Yes. Um, great. I mean, fantastic. I think we've done a tour of everything, uh, pretty much. So I'm going to open up to Q and I know we've got a whole bunch of, Q, uh, questions, um, that have been piling up here. So I'm just going to scroll through and where can we start? There's actually quite a lot. So, um, let's see. Right. I have, here's, here's one from Melissa. I have constant one-sided headache 24 seven about level two to three. I'm guessing that's out of 10. Melissa, if you could uh, qualify, uh, clarify. Is that a migraine? That's the question. I would have to ask, uh, just, do you have any other associated symptoms? Does anything else bother you? Light, noise, does it get worse when you're moving, right? What is the quality of the pain? Is it pulsating or is it throbbing or is it more like a dull pain? And um, do you get nauseous? And uh, do you respond to triptans? That's another another good question. Which what is a trip? Migraine? Sorry, what are triptans? It's an acute migraine pain medication. Ah, okay, right. Oh, right. So if it improves with that, it's more likely to be a migraine. Yes, exactly. But okay. I think the other reasons could also, mm -hmm. yeah, the other factors could also be be the case. I mean, if it's one sided, I would usually tend to say yes, but mm. it's a few more um, ticks to be confirmed. Awesome. Um, Melissa, so if you, if you want to add some details there in the chat, um, we oh, can yeah, look at that light noise. Yes. So yes, I would, I'm not, a, I'm not allowed to even give a medical diagnosis here. So I'm of course. not. But yeah, well, um, that's a disclaimer for all of our uh, webinars. Yes. Um, none of this is medical advice, of course, and you should seek yes, your physician. So this is uh, simply information um, to help you in your research. And, you know, a good thing to do is often to give it to your doctor um, and say, hey, yeah, this is interesting. But if they don't figure it out, because that's what happened to me, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty convinced this would be a migraine. Well, since we're on the topic of you, just like, so what was your personal journey with this? Yeah. In so, yeah. So my personal story started with the migraines being a non-existing headache. And then I started with 14. I started to get these one-sided severe headaches, light noise sensitivity, bit of nausea as well. And uh, terrible. Couldn't sleep, couldn't do anything. We went how to old the were doctors. You, how um, old were you when this I was, happened? I was 14 when it started. 14, okay. I think. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so puberty. Very, very typical. Went to my GP. He didn't have a clue. He said, oh, we need to get your brain, brain scan. So then I went to an MRI, EG. They checked for tumors, all normal. Then they said, oh, this could be psychological. So they sent me <laughs> to like a therapist. She asked, how are you doing in school? What's your worst subject? I'm, like, I'm not doing bad in school. I just have a headache. Well, then uh, at some point, my mom remembered that her grandma had this too. 
Then we asked Dr. Google, actually, this is no joke, one-sided headache, and then migraines came up. And then we knew when we went to a specialist and he confirmed it. it took like a year, yeah. which is insane thinking that right. it's so common. And, right? and how many days were you getting per month typically? Um, well, it started to be a few days a month. And mm. at first, painkillers would still respond. It would still respond to painkillers. And then it got worse and worse. At the end, I had sometimes um, 30 days straight, yeah. just constantly. Three days, one side, and then it would swap side and just start over. Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point, you just want to kill right. yourself. But right. um, I mean, now no, I'm fine, but I used to have chronic migraines as well. And I know, and then so you went on a ketogenic diet for a while. And are you still on the ketogenic diet? I believe you dropped it. I think some... I know Sean Scott. Thanks, Sean, for the compliment. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, it's true now. I do, um, well, I, I, I experiment so many things. It's just like, it's always changing. I was off the ketogenic diet for a year, then um, that was fine. But I'm always kind of like paleo, low carb-ish, but I ate a lot of fruit and stuff because mm -hmm. I just like fruit. And um, now I'm doing, in between now again, now, now I'm on again for a few days. I did carnivore for a week. Then I will introduce dairy again and see if I can maybe tolerate it because I love cheese and yogurt. And then I decide that I realize I don't and then I drop it again and then I'm paleo. And then, so it's always like, and I think for some now in my state, I'm fine. I don't need to be ketogenic all the time. I know it feels good sometimes. And sometimes it feels good just to cheat, eat the strawberries out of the garden, you know, or the raspberries that I walk past. So I'm, I'm much, much more mm -hmm. flexible now. Mm -hmm. uh, sugar and grains and all that easy carbs is a no-go for me still, just because I don't want to eat that stuff. I don't think it's good for me. Um, but it could be anything between strict carnivore, like meat and eggs only, to um, quite a liberal paleo approach, sometimes dairy in between. So it's more like a cyclical ketosis. Right. And I think that and, can be good because this is yeah. from an evolutionary perspective, we would have eaten the berries when we walked past. I suppose. As long as they weren't poisonous ones. <laughs> exactly. And maybe um, we two and then that would have be it for some of us. But Yeah. And and so these days, like how it sounds like it's quite infrequent. Roughly how often do you get a migraine? Now? Yeah. Um, twice a month maybe. Cool. That's it, like two days a month. And that's yeah, related to heavy metals or like super many triggers. Yeah. Um all right. This, this is a, a question for, I guess, for a simple explanation of, of everything you've spoken about today. So it says, please explain, this is from John, um, in simple terms, what the link is between ketosis and its effects on lowering migraines. So if you were to summarize in maybe a couple of sentences. Yeah. So, so in summary, we can go back to that one graph, basically. So there's um, eight known pathophysiological mechanisms, even more in migraine and ketone bodies can influence them all. It's energy metabolism related, so energy making and oxidative stress related, or mitochondrial. But there's also signaling molecules effect. So in low terms, mm. that mean that they change, like a hormone, they change the way that our genes are expressed or translated, mm. or they reduce inflammation, and they reduce hyperexcitability yep. in the brain. So there's several ways it can work in a mm -hmm. single patient. And I guess this is the beauty of it because it's not just one mechanism. We're trying to target chronic diseases, complex diseases like migraine, which is a very complex and individual with a single target approach that will never work. Ketones affect the body in so many different ways that they can help potentially a lot of different patients just because they can attack a different number of things that can play a role in a single patient. That's very nice. So it, it's not like one thing that- Yeah, it's like multifactorial effects. Multi, uh, multifactorial effects that add up yeah. and can be varied. In every single patient is, is different. Every single patient's migraine is different, even though it looks the same. Mm -hmm. And that's true for a lot of neurological diseases. They all look so different, but they have so much in common if you look at causes. Great. There's, there's a more of an exogenous uh, ketone salt question here. Um, basically, uh, this person has a problem staying in ketosis with the ketogenic diet, and it's hard to maintain the, the, the diet. So they're really asking, um, you know, about if um, the exogenous salts can be used uh, to, to support uh, ketosis. Um, would taking salts be safe enough uh, to maintain ketosis? Um, and could I take them as medication for the headaches? Yeah, so there's, um, there's even patients that report that if they feel a migraine coming very, very early on and they take a good DBHP salt 
at the beginning in high dose, it can even abort an attack sometimes. But what we're looking at and what we're mm. using mostly would be migraine prevention in the sense that you have to take it every day, as they say, to keep your levels in therapeutic ranges to feed the brain. Right. So we know that a patient typically has, or a lot of times has problems with liver, has problems with certain pathways that are needed to turn fat into ketone bodies. Mm -hmm. So, and they have, they're stressed all the time just because being sick is stressful. So cortisol and adrenaline are elevated. So that again, inhibits the making of ketones. And in that sense, exogenous ketones can help to keep ketones bodies in an area, a therapeutic dose level that can actually feed the brain, which we say is between one and three millimoles. Um, or they say, okay. not even me. That's okay. like the common therapeutic um, ketosis ranges. And if you're struggling to get there for whatever reasons, then uh, keto exogenous ketones can help because your liver doesn't need to do anything. Right. It's instant ketosis and that can help. And so, and so, I mean, you mentioned in your pilot study, the levels of ketones were 0 0.6, so they were lower than the one and they still had some benefits. Exactly. They still had some, some still had some benefits, yeah, because everything is better than nothing. Neuroimaging studies suggest that every one millimole increase in BHP levels can feed another 10% of the brain's energy demand. Now, this is just a heuristic, like a, how you can imagine. So the one, one, one millimole increase um, can feed another 10% of your brain energy needs. So that's quite powerful already. 10% that, is not That sounds like Stephen Cunan's work, is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that could be Stephen Cunan. Yeah. yeah. Um, great, great stuff if you're interested in brains. Um, exactly. Okay. Um, this, this... Very nice guy as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Jenny says, I have been diagnosed with vestibular migraine and prescribed a beta blocker propanol. Uh, the main symptom is oscillopsia. Excuse me for pronouncing this. I haven't come across these words before. A dizziness, wobbly vision where you feel unsteady and disorientated. Just wondering if the ketogenic lifestyle helps of this type of migraine. I don't know if you know anything specific about this one. I don't, I don't think they have uh, included vestibular migraine in the studies that were already done, but I also think that vestibular migraine could be linked to energy metabolism just from a mechanistical point of yeah. view, right? Um, again, keeping balance is energy demanding. Mm -hmm. So if you this vestibular problems means like you you lose um, your sense of space or orientation in space. And uh, this can also be oxidative stress related and or energy related, I think. So no medical advice, but I, I would assume it's worth a shot. It's, it's also, like an experiment. We often say it's worth an experiment, you know, like, you know, to yeah, test it out because th there's no harm in going on a ketogenic diet and seeing if that may work for you. Uh, and also, I mean, increasing, increasing a good salt, Himalayan salt. So again, with the hyperexcitability component in migraine, um, some people actually need minerals just to keep that dam up, right? And in vestibular migraine, the same. Um, that could be that your dam, that keeps the, the action potential stops them from going like crazy is too low. Okay. And mineral salts can help as well as uh, potentially- So, so how, how would they take that? Is that like uh, taking it in water or sprinkling it on food throughout yeah, the day? Eat more salts, don't restrain you. And uh, as good salt, Himalayan salt, stone salt, you can put it in your water. You can start drinking mineral water with good right. mineral content. You can put it on your food. However, you can just lick it off your hand, whatever you fancy. I mean, great. Well, I mean, this is this is typical advice also for the ketogenic diet as well. Um, you know, so it's, it's actually very common um, that this recommendation. And migraines tend to have low blood pressure, so even better. Excellent. Um, this one relates to APOE4. I'm not sure if that would be within your realm. Um, you can try. Give it a shot. <laughs> Um, so I'm sure. slow. Right. So I'm being homo being homozygous. Op <laughs> APOE4, I am solely reliant on the glymphatic system activated when we sleep for removal of waste products from the brain, including amyloid beta. Um, question. Yes, I wonder that is if, true, actually, well informed. So the, gl the glymphatic, for the for, like, for other listeners, the glymphatic system is basically the same as the lymphatic system, but it's for the brain, and it's basically, you know, moving waste from the brain, um, and it does it while we're, we're asleep. Uh, there's a vast simplification there. I wonder if ketone supplementation might boost this process, particularly in a hypoglycemic brain like mine, I'm 56, or would it promote increased cortisol and wakefulness and so downregulate this process? 
Um, well, I guess that as an APOE homozygous person, as you already said, I mean, it's, a ketogenic diet is not as easily done as in other people because of the saturated fatty acids that you have to watch out for. You also have to watch out for, of course, heavy metals and anything, any waste mm. product, as you said, right? But um, the good thing with the exogenous ketones is you don't actually have uh, long chain fat. You don't have long chain fatty acids. You don't have saturated fats. So, uh, and, but you have a clean energy source and anything that is clean, Few people know that your mitochondria are actually heavily involved in detox as well. So having good mitochondria will is assist detox, giving the mitochondria something that reduces oxidative stress, a cleaner fuel source could help the detoxing of your brain as well. And, um, and another thing to watch out for or to help maybe is eating thiol group rich foods, which are basically your APOE4 means they're lacking a thiol group. A thiol group is basically just a, a functional group in a molecule that's kind of like a claw that can hold on to heavy metals and other things to remove toxins. And um, it's APOE4 homozygous people don't have that thigh group on that molecules, but there's vegetables like cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, they have thigh groups uh, and maybe increasing that will be good for that person as well. Yeah. Ketone unrelated. Excellent. Um, so from Sean Scott, I believe you know Sean. Um, I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening. That's an honor. Awesome. How may ketone salts and the esters be made more tolerable for ingestion in larger doses? You may yeah, have answered that. There you go, your... Sean. Showing right here. I mean, I showed this up. <laughs> my head floor. It's exactly what we did. You, right. um, yes, we with the encapsulate with this. And um, it's not an encapsulation, but it's something like that. Uh, it's made much more tolerable with the esters. You have to be always care careful and patient. Tolerability issue is not only gastrointestinal with, um, with the esters, you have the liver issue. And I know he's a medical doctor, so maybe I can just add that um, with the ester, one molecule of butandiol to get to acetoacetate stage, you're consuming four NAD pluses on the way. NAD pluses is this master coenzyme that is involved in energy metabolism, which decreases drastically when we age. So the less of that, the worse. Chronic patients already have NAD plus reduction. The last thing you want in a patient is, re is reduce NAD plus further. So I would probably refrain from giving keto esters to mm. patients, even if you could encapsulate it, but an yeah. ester is so hard to encapsulate. Mm. I mean, it even comes back up if you've encapsulated and the encapsulation is gone. But, um, but with the salts, uh, this is, I think this is one feasible way of doing it. Great. Fantastic. Um, so Melissa asks, um, is it safe to take BHB and remain on a normal diet? I think, you know, you've really already answered that. Um, I mean, I cannot say it's, it's safe for 10 years because I don't know, but I know that it's safe for a few months for sure. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, it's always, you know, what do we say? I always say it's a risk benefit analysis. If your migraines are crippling and you're leaving a shitty life, even if you're dying five years earlier and you had a good life to live, that might be worth it. It's, um, it's a bit like you const I mean, the only times in nature we had glucose and ketone bodies high at the same time is really when you were starving and running away from a tiger. But it, it, that state exists, but that didn't. But it didn't last for it, two years. It exists for a long time. It doesn't mean that it's harmful, yeah. but it also explains, yeah if, you have, um, yeah, if you have ketones and glucose high at the same time, feel amazing. Your brain's on fire for that reason. Yeah because you have to run away from that tiger. Um, so it feels amazing, but I'm not saying that this is the way to go, right? If I had the choice and if it was my patient, I would recommend at least try a low carb diet. You don't have to be ketogenic necessarily. Try a low carb diet and then ketones then. That's probably the safest way to do it. Great, that's, that's, yeah, some good advice and pointers. For yeah, I would not say like uh, stick to your pizza and, uh, and cake and just add exogenous ketones, you'll still get sick just because it's not only the presence of things, mm -hmm. sometimes it has to be the absence of other harmful things as well. Yeah. Uh, this, this question, I think you've also kind of already answered, uh, but we'll go again. Uh, Fabrizio, would it be an option to take ketone salts when you expect an event, you know, expecting a, a migraine or a very stressful day or so? And it sounds like, you know, you would recommend that and you have. Yes, I would that. definitely recommend it. I think that's a great idea because well, if you're flying or whenever you know oxidative stresses, you're likely to run into an energy crisis Maybe this is better to prevent it, or you're just increasing your threshold, which is a good idea. Not sure it works for everyone, but if you try that, feel free to send me an email and let me know. 
I would be interested to see. I'm just looking through these because there's a lot um, and we're running out of um, time. Um, so I'm going to pick off. Um, here's, a, here's a question about migraines. Is it fairly typical for severity and frequency, frequency even, of migraines to increase as time goes on? Um, no. So, I mean, it's, this, it can increase, it can decrease, quite unpredictable. Sometimes if you get a child, uh, the, the, after the first child, it gets better, it's gone, and after the second mm -hmm. child, it's back. Some, a lot of people get better during pregnancy. Typically, you can say though, after menopause, for most, in old age, it gets less. But before that, it could be, it could be anything. And for guys, it gets less in their 30s. Right. So, so yes, oh, but otherwise it's um, fairly unpredictable. Guys are lucky in that sense. Yeah. Them, it's eight, really only 8% of Europeans have migraines for uh, guys, for the guys, I understand. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, guys yeah. are less. Still yeah. common, but much less. You know? Yeah. Still, still maybe a 10th too much. Um, have you also found, this is from Laura, have you also found that energy excess can cause migraines? For instance, if I do not have at least three to four hours after my last meal before bed, a migraine will occur in my sleep. If I also use intermittent fasting two meals a day, I get migraine protection. Has this been looked into? It's, it's, it feels like a not energy uh, deficit, but an energy excess. Very interesting question. Great observation. I think I can explain it. So yes, if you have too much energy, what happens? We already discussed that when you are turning energy or your food into mm. energy in the body, right? Your mitochondria will make oxidative stress. Now, if you have too much energy consumed or too much food consumed, your oxidative mm. stress will again increase for a while and then impair later on when your food is digested, impair energy metabolism again. So even with too much food, you can increase oxidative stress and make things work in the long run. So, so potentially really smaller that. portions, it sounds like smaller portions might help. Smaller portions, maybe regular, it's, it's individual. Not, not everybody gets uh, too much. And again, it's, it's, an, it's a difference mm -hmm. if you eat like a large protein and fat meal yeah. and that is metabolized and absorbed over time mm -hmm. rather than eating uh, uh, yeah, an easy carb, a high carb meal, um, not complex carb, but simple carbs that basically hit your bloodstream uh, after 20 minutes and spike it. And uh, then your mitochondria get all this energy and must turn into ATP. And then you get this huge increase in oxidative stress, whereas if, if you use complex carbs or something fatty or protein that is basically getting, hitting your blood over time, mm. you probably don't get this oxidative stress increase. So it really depends, I would say. Good questions. Really good questions. Yeah, so, very interesting, interesting ones. Yeah, perfect. Uh, people have, people have uh, really uh, interesting scenarios here. Uh, so Marco has, um, Marco's asking, you know, asking about uh, the tests and studies uh, that you're doing at the moment. Um, he says, basically, when they've finished, what is planned in terms of a timeline for you to launch your products? Meaning, when will you be able to buy the products of Keto Swiss? Yeah, so this- Have you got any estimate or- We're, we're being- Are you allowed to share it? Um, we're, not, we're not even allowed to sell in Europe, unfortunately, because of this novel food approval that we need. We're now estimating to hit the US market though, and then you guys can order it from the US to Europe. That usually works well. I didn't say this just now. Uh, it's 2021, depending on the funding situation between Q1 and Q2. Great. If we now get a lot of money suddenly from somewhere, then it could be earlier, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, I, I, I'm afraid that's what we're aiming for. You can go on our website and uh, you can just type it in here and you can subscribe to the newsletter. We don't ever send anything. No, uh, no fear of that, but that will inform you when we No spam. No spam <laughs> at all. So far, nothing. We also have a blog post every week mm -hmm. that you can check out, which is um, basically anything related to healthy lifestyle and then keto and diets and supplements and that kind of things. Um, if anybody wants to learn more. Excellent. Um, so Joy says, I get about nine migraines a month. Mine are definitely metabolic and hormonal. 50 milligrams of sumatriptan aborts 99% yep. of the time. I eat low carb. I'm not in ketosis. I've tried to take DBHB to abort and it's worked a few times, but I don't take it daily. Is the idea that we should take exogenous uh, daily or just as an abortive? I think you've kind of uh, spoken yeah. about that already, but could you summarize? Oh, so the, 
Yeah, so the idea is after, if you have more than five migraine days a month, one says, mm -hmm. um, then you're basically, you should be thinking about a prophylactic t therapy, right? Yeah. Not an abortive therapy. So with mm -hmm. nine days a month, I think that would almost justify taking exogenous ketones, DBHB probably twice a day, try twice a day, yep. over a few months, write me if it works. Basically preventing attacks from happening, reducing them long-term. Excellent. Well, let's, unless we've rounded up all the questions, we, we got through uh, most of them. So just a few final notes basically about you um, and, and basically for, to help people learn more. So where should someone look first to learn more about migraines, about brain energy, metabolism, ketone salts? Are there any good books or presentations? What would be the best resources? Um, there's a good book in German, but I don't think there's many German speakers here. I mean, there is, you have with, it's, it's a little tough because um, there's not so much in the migraine space um, already published. I did make some videos uh, and mm -hmm. I've been interviewed a few times. So you can check mm -hmm. out on YouTube if you want to learn more about this. We have some information on the website. You can also just put my name and migraine in PubMed. You'll find okay. the studies we discussed. Mm -hmm. I also have a link to the studies. Uh, I, I'll find it um, so people can just take a screenshot if they want. Let me just- Yeah, I also sent the uh, studies uh, to all you guys who got the email. So you'll have them there as well. Oh, that's uh, true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and we'll put them up with the webinar afterwards uh, with the show notes um, underneath. Any references that uh, Lena has pointed to will be there. Um, what are the best ways? I mean, you might have already said this, but what would be the one best way uh, for people to connect with you and learn more about what you're up to? I'm found on Twitter, Facebook, um, and LinkedIn. Uh, Were you most active? Um, I would say try Twitter because Facebook, I don't, I have too many friends requests that I don't uh, ex accept all strangers anymore. So I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, just write me on Twitter or write a comment under YouTube. Although, yeah, Twitter is probably the best idea. Here's the links again. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, I guess. You can try Facebook, but write me a message and not send me a friend request. <laughs> something that I can, could ask for. You can also, um, yeah, you can also write me an email. I suppose uh, that that's interesting too. That always works. It's um, you can we can share the email. I suppose um, it's just my name, Elena dot Gross at Kido dot Swiss. Great. Yeah. So we'll uh, post that up. Um, so is there anyone besides yourself? I mean, I think you may mention uh, this, the Italian research, you know, but would you recommend to learn more about your topic besides yourself? Yes. So Di Lorenzo has done the ketogenic diet study. So you can also put his name and migrate into PubMed. Great papers, mm -hmm. good research, mm -hmm. a wonderful guy, no presence anywhere, obviously, because he's a medical doctor and a, and a researcher. Um, but that's great. And there's, um, there's some some books and um, we have a keto book published now I, I wrote two chapters in that but again it's in german so um there's probably other people that are talking about this online now i think there's something called the migraine miracle might have some information uh, i think it was called and there's um another book that i have to look peter meash i think he's called but it's a german book but maybe it's translated he also talks about migraine and metabolism a bit and obviously my my one of my supervisors um, Dominic D'Arostino was also um, my ex external supervisor. He has great knowledge on exogenous ketones in general. And then um, Professor Jean Schönen, he's a Belgian guy. He knows a lot about metabolism and migraine, not ketosis, hmm. metabolism guy in like 2000 publications. So if anyone's interested, he, they can check him out as well. Obviously. You know. Awesome. Um, and just one thing, I mean, we've covered a lot of stuff, but um, do you fast at the moment? It sounds like maybe you don't, or do you practice any fasting at all? Um, I can already do, I mean, I used to when I was, um, before I got a little bit different because I did get heavy metal poisoning. So it's yeah. a little different. But uh, before that, I did seven day fasts twice, I think. And now I'm back to 16 hours sometimes. So sometimes I fast for 16, sometimes I do 10 only. If I'm hungry, I eat, right? If I'm not hungry, I don't eat. So it could be that I don't eat for 20 hours occasionally. Um, I so, try to do 14 to mm -hmm. 16 and sometimes I just do 10 because I'm living life yeah. and uh, breakfast is served or whatever. Yeah. Fantastic. 
Um, yeah, so um, it sounds like spontaneous fasting. Um, well, so the last thing I would just like to massively thank you for all this information. I'm sure the audience uh, wants to thank you too, because this has been a huge download and I bet it's given people a lot of clarities. Um, and then last thing I'd just like to ask you, is there any, do you have any asks or requests for the community, anything um, that you would like to ask them? Yes, actually, I would love to ask you for one favor now that we are almost here for two hours. Um, I would like to have one minute of your time, if you can. Currently, something exciting is happening. Keto Swiss has been voted on place six of all Swiss startups, um, but the contest is still going for three weeks. So we really need every vote, and it only takes one minute. I put up a um, QR code here. I can send you that as well. I can put it in the show notes, maybe. Just to, if you is there could a link or add, and if is there That's anything link we could share in the you. chat now? Um, or how, how would you best do it? Yes, let me copy that. Um, yes, it's a good idea. Let me uh, copy this. It literally takes a minute. And you have to have a LinkedIn profile, though, um, sadly. So without a LinkedIn profile, you can't vote. But let me find the chat. Because once I'm sharing this, I don't have the chat. Anyway. If you do that, I will be forever grateful. One minute, just click on the link. It's already the Keto Swiss profile. It's a golden button boat now. Click on that. Log in with your LinkedIn profile. Done. Thanks, guys. So the link's now in the chat. Um, so you can click on that. And in the meantime, everyone is sending uh, lots of appreciation. You've got uh, Emmanuel says, thank you so much. Excellent webinar. Paola um, says, great. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, John says, excellent with three exclamation marks. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of appreciation there and a lot of thanks. James says, really great webinar. I loved it. Thanks guys. Um, so you're doing a great job here. Very good questions, Elena. Uh, thank you for the detailed answers, Elena. Um, thank you, very informative and on and on. <laughs> so, Thanks so much, guys. That was fantastic questions. A lot of variation showed you can think for yourself and you've, uh, you've already driven deep or been diving deep into the, into the whole topic of ketosis. So mm. it's been a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, and thank you for making the time, Elena, in these busy times. I know you're also a busy entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> yes. So, you know, it, it does get busy. So I really appreciate the time you made for this. Um, and, and there you go. It's good to see you again. Uh, it's been a little while. Maybe after COVID, <laughs> in some conference, we'll catch up again. Yes, of when course. When conferences are allowed again, one day. Yes, I, I will be looking forward to that. Yeah. Certainly, we can, we can chat some other time as well on what's mm. going on with Source and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting times and exhaustion yeah. speakers in general. Lots of yeah, with a sustained with sustained release like that, it's going to be very interesting times. Um, yeah, definitely. And so I have one ask for, for you webinar guys. Also, um, it would be just for feedback on this webinar. And if you have a moment, uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on these to you know so we we can do a better job going forward. I've just thrown the link in. Uh, for the webinar feedback. So if you have any feedback, it's basically 30 seconds after you've done <laughs> Elena's ask. Um, if you could just click that and, and give us some feedback, that would be really super helpful. Um, just tells us what to focus on and what you guys uh, get a lot out of and, and so on. And you put any comments in there um, to guide our future webinars and so on. Um, and that's really it. So I'm going to let this lie for a little while, guys, um, just so you get a bit of time to deal with that. Um, and otherwise, um, Elena, again, thank you so much. Um, Thanks for having me, Damien. And Great uh, let's connect you. again soon. Certainly. Bye, everyone. Stay migraine-free and corona-free. <laughs> uh, have, a, have a great week. All right. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.